a German preacher, August H. Frank founded an orphanage to care for the homeless children of Hale. One day when Frank desperately needed funds to carry on his work, a destitute Christian widow came to his door begging for a docket, a gold coin. Because of his financial situation, he politely but regretfully told her he couldn't help her. Disheartened, the woman began to weep. Moved by her tears, Frank asked her to wait while he went to his room to pray. After seeking God's guidance, he felt that the Holy Spirit wanted him to change his mind. So trusting the Lord to meet his own needs, he gave her the money. Two mornings later, he received a letter of thanks from the widow. She explained that because of his generosity, she had asked the Lord to shower the orphanage with gifts. That same day, Frank received 12 dockets from a wealthy lady and two more from a friend in Sweden. He thought he had been amply rewarded for helping the widow, but he was soon informed that the orphanage was to receive 500 gold pieces from the estate of Prince Ledecky van Wartenborg. I'm German and I'm struggling with these German words. When he heard this, Frank wept in gratitude. In sacrificially providing for that needy widow, he had been enriched, not impoverished. Amen. And if you're familiar at all with another uh, famous German who had many orphanages, George Mueller, he's um, known for saying, God doesn't judge us by what we give, by, but by what we keep. And so this morning, I don't want that story to guilt trip anyone. I don't think it should be taken to mean that every time there's a need, we have to give. Um, I also don't, I don't think that um, each case is, is Similar, I think oftentimes it depends, but I think what that story does illustrate is one, that God should be in control of our money. Yes. And I love the fact that even though he had a need and was doing a good thing, I mean, he's helping orphanage, orphans himself, he still said, well, Father, you're the one in control of my finances. What should I do with this? It also shouldn't be taken to mean that, hey, if I give a dollar, I'm expecting $10,000 back and, and for, out of a, a greedy heart. But if I obey the Father and am generous, He's going to supply my need. He'll take care of me. And then hopefully, I will continue to be a conduit of blessing that he will continue to give to and through. So, Father, we thank you so much just for this illustration, God. Um, and I do lift up those around the world who are caring for, for orphans, God, and widows, and sacrificially living um, to bless people in those groups. And I do pray that you provide for them. Lord, I'm sure many of us can think right now of, of people we know who are running orphanages. I think of... Uh, my friend Peter in San Pedro, Mexico, and just ask that, that you bless him and his work this morning. But God, we thank you that you love us, God, that you are in control, and we want you to be in control of money. We thank you that we have money, but we don't want money to have us and to control us, God. We want uh, it to be a tool that will be used to further your kingdom. So we pray you receive the giving today. I know many of us have entered in, into the covenant tithe with you, Lord. Um, but sometimes, God, even beyond that, it's important to stop and ask, Lord, what do you want me to give for a particular need? God, I pray that you use the money that's given today, that you would bless many people, and that you would provide for everyone in this room who has trusted in you as their giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope to convince you that we are supposed to be very serious about sharing the gospel with the lost. Um, I hope to convince you that there are some methods and places that are just naturally more successful than others. Um, you're going to hear messages about your neighbors, about the poor, about children, uh, messages about prisoners and the sick and homeless. And you will also hear updates about share posts that we are launching as a church family. Um, Lewis Prison, Cancer Treatment Centers of America, Verado Coffee Company, Buckeye Cow Cowboy Ministries, just mentioned that one a moment ago. The Park Outreach, Buckeye Outreach Ministries. Um, others that you're going to hear about. And you will hear me request that each one of you should personally invite one person to the Harvest America Crusade with Greg Laurie on June 11th. And if possible, because some of you will be volunteering in different areas, but if possible, that not only should you invite that person, but you should offer to take them and sit with them 
at the event. I think this is a wonderful golden opportunity that we have as a church family. Yes, amen. And we have a, an amazing, I mean, a world-renowned speaker that's coming to our area, and we get to have the chance to invite friends to go. And there's a very high likelihood that if they don't know Christ, they will accept Christ yes. that night. Amen. So you've, you've just got to do that. You've got to do that. Today, let's talk about fishers of men. Fishers of men. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I remember, this, I remember the song when I was a little kid mm -hmm. in Booster Band. Some of you don't know what Booster Band is, but I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. We call them all fishers of men. I will make you I'm fishers, and I loved it. When I was a kid, boy, I'd cast way out there. <laughs> if you follow me, if you follow me. Our booster band, I don't know why we did this. I, that kind of mixed another song with the army of God together with, you know, fishers of men. But that's what we did. If you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. If you follow me. Now, Jesus said those words. If you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of bass? No. Fishers of catfish? No. Fishers of men. And he's talking to fishermen when he said it. Um, he might say something different to you in your line of work that would connect it in a special way so that you knew this is really, this is very important. Um, so this morning, we will read the very scripture that that phrase comes from. We're creating these share posts around the city as part of our strategy to take the gospel message, listen to this, mission strategy to various preaching points around our community so that we draw people into our hub, our church, so that the kingdom of God may grow. Amen. And so, is this series about proselyting? I want to be straight up with you. This series of teachings is designed to make you consider very seriously your role as a believer in Christ. If you are a Christian, you will share your faith with those who don't know Jesus. If you are a Christian, you will share your faith with those who don't know Jesus. Now here's something that I hear or something like it. I've heard lots of times people will say, Christians should just practice their religion without trying to force it on others. Have you heard something like that? You know, that's fine for you to serve Christ. And hey, I'm glad that works for you. And I have no problem with that. Just don't bring your religion into the workplace. I'm going to be very honest with you. It's, it's a very confusing time to be a Christian. And also a very important time in our nation. I want to speak very truthfully with you. and Very carefully and cautiously for a moment. Um, individuals will say Islam is a religion of peace when it is not. And I feel it's important to make this statement. There are well over 100 calls to violence in the Quran. Now in the Bible, there are scriptures about violence and sometimes it gets confusing. But in the Bible, it is housed in the context of a historical context of national war or it is housed in a poetry style so that it is very clear that Jesus corrects any Old Testament concepts and says we are not violent people. Christianity carried to its logical conclusion brings you to a place of love and compassion and peace for those around you. Um, listen to the statement. Muslims 
who do not engage in violence, according to the Quran, are considered less honorable than the ones who do. There are approximately 130, 135 calls to violence, and um, the Quran encourages a radical commitment to violence. And in modern times, what's happening is people are saying that the Quran does not call for violence. It's been taken out of context, it is misinterpreted, but that is not true historically, and it is not true literary. And so, um, in the last 1900 years, there have been many people martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. But did you know that in the past 100 years, there have been more people martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ than in the last 1900 years combined? So, um, it, it's a very, very confusing time to be a Christian because Christians are being told that um, Islam is a religion of peace. And in light of 9-11, I can't believe that this is happening in America, but Islam is on the increase and growing rapidly. And there's also this strange phenomenon that's happening of this thing called Chrislam, which is a mixture of Christianity and Islam, and the two are not, they do not cohabit. They, they do not mate. It's, it's a strange mixture. And while all that is happening, for some reason, Christians are singled out and told, do not bring your faith into the public arena. We do not want your faith in our legislation. We do not want your faith in the workplace. We do not want your faith in the education system. That's fine for you to be a Christian. Christians should practice their religion without trying to force it on others. But here's, here's where the, the conflict comes in. If you understand the entire heart of Christianity, the entire basis and foundation is that there is a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who rescues humanity from the lostness of their sinful state. And only by the name of Jesus may a person be saved. And you and I will have to stand before God for the way that we have shared our faith. And let's cut to the chase. This series has to do with our doctrine of hell. And when I say this, sometimes people snicker. They think that I'm not being serious. I'm being very serious. I read hell in the scripture. My interpretation of it is that hell is a literal place, an eternal place. And I hope hell is not real. I mean, I really hope it's not real. But I think it is. And this is one of my pet peeves. When I speak uh, about hell in Pentecostal churches, very often you'll get people saying, Amen! And I understand why. I think it is because so many pastors shy away from talking about hell that they're so relieved that our pastor actually does believe in hell. He's actually preaching about hell that when they hear it, they sort of go, um, oh, amen, because I believe that too. But here's the thing. We should not be elated about hell. We should be deeply disturbed about hell. I took the pan of veggies out of the oven uh, Thursday with, with that pot holder. You know the one. <laughs> the one that's old and worn and it's not quite... Yeah, you have one in your drawer. Too. Do you have one of those drawers? We have one of those drawers where everything goes in. It's like everything has its place where it lives somewhere and this and the other thing. Bowls go on this rack. And, but there's that one drawer where if we don't know where it lives, that must be where it lives. And that pot rack came out of, out of that 
You know, I grabbed that little glove, and man, it's worn thin, and I grabbed the pan out of the oven. Oh, man, was it hot. I'm looking for a place. I set it down on the counter so fast. And I'm being as serious as I can. I'm being as serious as I can. I said, oh, God, I hope hell isn't real. What a horrible place. Just for one instant, the, the burning that I felt in my hand, and I even had protection. And there are different schools of thought on hell. The most brilliant minds have looked at it. And depending on your interpretation of Scripture, some fall out in different categories. One broad one would be a, just a real broad brush, brush stroke, universalism. Um, basically, everyone gets a get out of hell free card. There is, there's no, there's no delineation. It's all figurative. It, it's not literal. There's the school of thought that says annihilism, and that is that yes, there's hell, but the judged will be consumed instantly and gone eternally, um, go, gone, just not existing any longer. There is eternal damnation and. This is the historical Assemblies of God view, and that is that hell is a place of eternal torment and separation from God. And that is what I believe. And so when, when people say Christians should just practice their religion without trying to force it on others, I disagree. I disagree in the strongest way. Because there's some, there are currents going on behind our scenes which we don't realize that have eternal implications. And so you are being conditioned that you live in the United States of America and we are tolerant. And if you're not tolerant, then you are a hater and you better keep your mouth quiet. But the only thing wrong with that is that you and I will stand before God and people will step into eternity with Jesus or without. And there is this erroneous teaching. It's, it's, it's not a correct teaching that says, if I don't share my faith in Christ with someone, somebody else will. If they're supposed to be saved, then God will see to it that they will hear the message somehow. I don't discredit that God works in a lot of ways. But let me tell you something. People die every single day without Jesus Christ. And they go into eternity. Many of them without the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. So I, I disagree with that logic. Actually, you will, you'll be shocked to hear that I actually agree with an atheist Ken Gillette. He's the famous magician for Teller and Penn. And, and I'm going to show you just a little video. Let me, let me set this up for you. This, I showed this once before several years back. This video was filmed in 2008. And um, since that time, I'm told that, that Penn Gillette actually became a believer. I don't know if that is verified. I think that would be wonderful if it's true. But here's, here's the story. Here's what's going on. He's just finished a show in Vegas, and um, he has a man who waits for all the people signing autographs. He waits till the very end, and he comes up and shares a gift with him. And how, how much it touched Penn, how, mu how deeply it touched him, how moved he was by it. And I would really encourage you to watch. You can search this on YouTube. This one's scaled down. It's just shy of three minutes but that we'll watch. But there's a longer version of it. It's so touching. And when I see this, it makes me want to share Jesus with everyone who doesn't know him. Let's watch this together, guys. And he walked over to me and he said, um, I was here last night at the show, and uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted, and he was very complimentary of, 
about my use of language and um, complimentary about you know honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff. No reason to go anywhere. He said nice stuff. And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon pocket edition. He said, I wrote in the front of it. And I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of uh, proselytizing. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell, and people could be going to hell, or not getting eternal life, or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I attack on you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, I've thought of it conceptually. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, like to show and so on. And then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Now, I know there's no God. And one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. Uh, but I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. It's a pretty good sermon from an atheist. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes we can know things, and we have knowledge, and we have books, and we have libraries, but a personal relationship will touch someone so deeply that someone who, they, they are sure that they know there's no God and there can't be and blah, blah, blah. But that was a good man. Mm -hmm. And he was sane and he looked me right in the eyes and he shared his faith and he cared enough about me to do that for me. Amazing. So let's read the scriptures. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 1, it starts off this way. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats, two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let your nets down to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing, but if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I am such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. As soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Now you could say a lot from this text, couldn't you? I mean, I've heard a lot of different sermons from this text. 
You could talk to the discouraged and say, they had fished all night and they worked hard and they didn't catch a thing. I know stretches of ministry where it's been like that. I've been working hard and there's very little to show for it. Some of you, you can relate to that. Faithful in ministry, working hard, serving God, praying, reading the Word, devoting it all to Him. And you're wondering sometimes, what do I really have to show for it? I mean, that could be a whole sermon in itself. I'm going to tell you something. God sees everything. He record, he re, he's recording blessings in heaven for all and every effort. And He sees and He rewards openly. Or you could talk about this. Once they started catching fish, it got messy. They cried out. This is what the text says. They cried out, help! Can you just imagine fishing and your nets are so full, your boat's starting to sink, and you've got other boats trying to come and get fish, and they're starting to sink? Sometimes... When a true move of God happens, boy, it can get messy. And you can find yourself crying out, help! But really, there's three things I want to bring out of this text this morning. And here's the first one. And it's spoken of Peter. You could say about all of them. Number one, he was awestruck by the number. Exact wording from the text. He was awestruck by the number of fish they caught. Oh, pastor, I don't want to go to a church that grows. I want my church to stay small. I know everybody. They know me. It's Everybody's happy. Can't we just be content? I mean, it's very nice. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very enjoyable. It's very comfortable. Listen, God's church was never designed to be enjoyable and comfortable. It was, that was never the plan from the, the beginning. It is a living organism. And as such, it's continually uh, facing change and challenge. That's the axiom of church life. That's the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be reaching out. We're supposed to be stretching and being stretched. We're supposed to be growing, ever expanding. And, and so the disciples, they were awestruck by the number of fish they caught. Would to God that Buckeye First Assembly would be awestruck yeah. by the number of fish we catch in 2017. I think that would be wonderful to be crying out, help! I may not know what I'm saying, right? But I think that would be wonderful. It would definitely be on target with God's goals. Number two, here's the second point. They did the catching. They did the catching. They did. I mean, Jesus doesn't just say, fish, jump in the boat. Jesus says, drop down your nets again. And they pull in the fish. Th that is the very exact wording. Listen to the careful wording of the verse. For he was all struck by the number of fish they had caught. I've heard it all my life. And you probably have too. And I do believe it's true. This old saying, we catch the fish and the Holy Spirit cleans them up. How many of you have heard that? Said it? I have. And I do believe that. We, we catch the fish. And it's His job to clean them up. When people say that, by the way, here's what they're meaning. They're meaning this. We need to be actively engaged in evangelism. We need to all find a way to be evangelists. Reaching out and catching fish. But once a fish gets caught, the Holy Spirit is the one who cleans them. I, I know some of you fishermen, you love to catch fish, but you don't really like to clean them. And some of the wives in the room might say, yeah, I end up doing all the butchering and all that stuff, putting them in the fridge. I don't know, depending on your family. But let me tell you something. I do believe that statement is true. But here's the thing. I think I, I, would, I would revamp that. 
Um, I, I would qualify it to say it a different way. Because this is, this is important for us to know as a church family. Actually, the Holy Spirit does the catching and He uses us to do it. Now, there's a, a slight difference, isn't, isn't there? I mean, it's wonderful because we are relieved of the success ratio. It's just our job is just to be a witness. What is a witness? A witness is the one who says, I saw this, I stand and testify the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. This is what I witnessed. And I witnessed that Jesus Christ changed my life. He, he saved me. He redeemed me. Boy, I would be a mess without him. Can I just share up with you for a moment about him? We witness. And the Holy Spirit is the one who does the catching. And the Holy Spirit also is the one who does the cleaning. But guess what? Very often He uses us to do the cleaning. Um, I, I think it's important. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed in church life, and I, I, get, um, I, I get really particular about this, I notice that sometimes when we bring people in with all kinds of issues in their life, we are so quick to judge them for not living up to our standards. And, and what we have to, what we must do is to be patient and to be willing to invest the time it takes to love people along and to pray with them through and, and say, here are some areas of growth that could happen in your life to give loving accountability and to bring them through the discipleship process. Sometimes that takes real intentional effort. And I, I am so proud of our church family when I see that happening, when I see that people are starting and they're beginning a walk with the Lord, but then maybe just right out the chute, there's a few little briars and some difficulties and some sticky points. And someone comes alongside them and says, let me just, can I just model to you? Here's how I've done it. Now, I'm not perfect, but someone helped me, and I would love to help you and help them to grow in the Lord. Um, I really believe that that's, that's important. We need to be willing to invite individuals with all kinds of pain into our life. Uh, into our church life and be faithful and patient with them to walk them through those difficulties through to the other side. This statement I'm putting on the screen and I want you to think about it. The reality is we circle the wagons because we feel threatened or because we're worried that our message and ministry won't withstand the test. Let me give you indicators. When I see Christians saying, mine, ours, this is ours, we've got to protect this, I get concerned because it feels like, okay, circle the wagons. Keep the, the challenges out there. Circle the wagons. The reason we do that is because we're really afraid. Maybe our message won't withstand the close scrutiny or, or, or maybe we feel threatened in that we catch the fish and the Holy Spirit cleans them. But, but I would say it this way. The Holy Spirit catches the fish. And He allows us to be part of it. And the Holy Spirit cleans the fish. And He allows us to be part of it. Um, here's the deal. Some of you have been guilty of thinking, like I said earlier. If God wants somebody to be saved, they'll get saved. But the reality is, hear me, there are people all around us every day stepping into eternity. And many of them are doing so having never heard the truth about the Lord. So think about these words. Here's the next statement. God will do things for you. I mean, how many of you say, yes, God's done something for you? Amen. God will do things for you that you cannot do for yourself. But... God won't do for you what you can do for yourself. You see the difference? And I don't think this is absolute all the time. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying by and large, in general, 
God knows when we can't do anything about it. He is willing to help us. But there are certain expectations that God has for us. When He knows that we can do it, He expects us to do our part. So let's move on to number three. The third one is it's a team effort. Listen to the words. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they caught, as were the others with him. Catch this. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. It is a, it's a team effort. We must love one another so that we can have the best, most possible, effective team to reach out to our community. Um, I was talking with Jimmy earlier before church. This time of year, I love, he knew it too. I, I love this time of year. This is my Super Bowl. I'm a basketball guy. I just love March Madness. And if you didn't know, U of A is in the Sweet 16, and Howard House is kind of excited about that. And we're cheering for U of A next weekend, hoping they can go all the way to the finals. I, they got a good team. They, they could do it this year. Um, but, but I just love basketball. And if you're watching any of the March Madness tournament, you're noticing the really good teams who don't have solo superstars, but they pass the ball and they look for the good shot. They play good team defense. They collapse upon the offense. And I mean, they work together as a team. It's not college ball, but in the NBA, the San Antonio Spurs are the epitome of teamwork. And I don't even like the Spurs. I mean, I, you know, they're not one of my favorite teams. But I'm going to say, they are one of the best teams. They are consistently competing and very often making it to the championship tournament uh, at the end of this series, uh, championship series at the end of the year, because they're such a good team. They don't have superstars. They... The one guy you would call their superstar, Kawhi Leonard, who is an amazing guy. Last week I heard him interviewed at the end of a game. He had scored 36 points. Let that sing in. He scored 36 points. Had a boatload of rebounds and a lot of assists. He is amazing. And they came up to him and said, Kawhi, how did you feel about your game tonight? And he goes, uh, well, I thought I played well. <laughs> Give the microphone to some of these other showboats. It was all about me. I put the team on my back. I did it, blah, blah, blah. But the team player, who cares who gets the credit? We just want to succeed. And their coach, Greg Popovich, has instilled that into the team. They're not very fancy. They're not very fun to watch. They are methodical. It's the same thing over and over. You trust Pop's system. If you don't do the system, you sit on the bench. It doesn't matter if you're paid a billion a year. You sit on the bench unless you do the system. And I mean, it is an amazing team. See, that's the way the Bible describes us. Paul says one waters, another plants the seed. But it is God who gives the increase. And so we're each finding ways to share. And maybe, maybe there's some overlap. Maybe we know some of the same people. And one is loving on them in this way. And one is loving on them in another way. And, and together we're seeing the kingdom increase. Many years ago, there was a, a little revival in a small town. Texline, Texas. If you've ever been there, Texline is right on the state line between Texas and New Mexico. In fact, it's only uh, eight miles from um, Clayton, New Mexico, where my wife Stephanie was born. And they had, many, many years ago, just a small, sleepy little town, one little flashing yellow light, you know, and they had a diner, lots of farmers. They had a revival at their church. And probably, um, just like when we have guests come, there's, somebody's going to make sure that they have the things they need. You know, probably the pastor put an ad in the local newspaper that, that was really popular. There no Facebook back then, none of that kind of media. And, um, you know, the, the crew worked extra hard that week. Let's clean the church, make sure it looks nice, we had revival. And... Um, 
Um, people prayed, no doubt people prayed for that revival. God, just move, touch us, touch our lives. The invitations go out. Nothing of consequence really seemed to happen. Um, there was not an overwhelming sense of people flooding into the altars and accepting Christ as their Savior. I mean, it, it, they, had, they had one 10-year-old boy got saved. Just one. He was the only one during the revival. I mean, it, you definitely wouldn't call it the Brownsville Revival. It would not be called Toronto Blessing. It was just, um, in some respects, you might look at the effort and say, boy, a lot of work went into that. Was it really worth it? Was it a failure? But yeah, one pretty cool thing that happened that, that week of the revival was that the, the pastors put the word out, could some of you have our evangelist, and here's the thing, I don't even know the evangelist's name. Nobody even seems to know his name. But could one of you have the evangelist stay in your home and the Criswell family raise their hand so he can come stay with us out on the farm? And so uh, when he went out on the farm, he connected with the family and, and little 10-year-old Wally Amos, he really looked up and he, to this guy. He, he watched his life and, and this evangelist poured into him over the course of the revival. And, and he was the one at the end of the revival, the little 10-year-old boy that got saved, Wally Amos, gave his heart to Jesus. And God placed his calling upon W.A. Criswell. And he became the pastor of the great First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. And at the time that he retired, there were over 40,000 members. Never underestimate when you plant a seed. Right. When, when the Holy Spirit says to you, say something, say it now. But I don't understand, Holy Spirit. I, I, don't, I don't even know. I might stutter. We work together as a team, and God does His work. Now, I want to share with you here in closing. Here's the hook. And, and what I mean by that, you're familiar with this, most of you. When I teach a, a, a message, when I preach, I try to close out the message with the most important thing. Sometimes I'll say, what's the big idea? Or, or sometimes it, it might be, um, here's the takeaway. I want you to leave with this concept that we need to do, we need to act, we need to respond. And so, as we're talking and we'll get more into specifics about outreach in the coming weeks, but as we're talking about God's favorite fishing holes, each week I'm going to say, hey, here's the hook. And this morning, here's the hook. No fear, more focus, and all in, all in abandonment. I'm stealing that phrase from the class that Dale is teaching on Wednesday nights. All in. No fear, more focus, all in abandonment. So this morning as we close, examine your tackle box. Take a look at your fishing gear and be honest with yourself. Be very honest with yourself. Why do I not witness? Am I battling fear? Am I, am I afraid? Maybe. Maybe that's it for many of us. It could be. And I, I can tell you, after years of street ministry and years of going door to door and done all kinds of different things, there's still always that little bit of something inside me that when I have that moment come up where it just says, oh, am I sure I want to do that? The flesh will all, it will never be comfortable. It will never be easy. So get over that. And ask yourself, if you are afraid, I mean, admit it, Hey, I'm struggling with fear about sharing my faith in Jesus. Ask yourself, what am I afraid of? Really, what am I afraid of? How is my focus? More focus. We need more focus. Am I all over the place? Do I have too many irons in the fire? Do I really care about souls? 
In a moment, I'm going to pray that the Lord will rid us of distractions, rid us of dark moods, rid us of unproductivity and drifting, and streamline us to the main things that He's called us all to. And then this last area of all in abandonment. Am I committed? Am I committed? I mean, am I really committed? Am I hanging on to stuff? Or have I abandoned all for the sake of the calling of the Lord Jesus Christ? What do I need to clear out of my tackle box? What needs to happen for me today in order to be an effective witness for the Lord this week. I want you to bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, this is probably the most important prayer I've prayed in a long time. Because I see in my mind's eye a vision of what could happen if we all took this message seriously. If even half of us in this room took this message to heart, the exponential power of that upon our community would be immeasurable. So I'm asking you to rid us of dark moods and strip away unproductivity. I'm praying, oh God, that you help us to stop drifting. Give us a focus of those who need you as Savior. Lord, right now, I confess my fear as the pastor. I confess my fear. The fear of, what if I'm not successful as a pastor? I just confess that to you. And I just speak out for um, a representative for our church family. Lord, I, I'm afraid. I'm fearful. It's a dangerous time. What might be the consequences if I truly share with people my beliefs? Would they ridicule me? Would they make fun of me? Would they even, could there be possible litigation against me if, I, if all I did was stand up for you? I'm just asking you right now, Holy Spirit, whoosh, just wash away fear. Just push it away. And help us to be bold the way your early followers were when you said, if you follow me, you will start fishing for people. And they walked away from their nets. And they walked away from their boats. And they came on the shore and they followed you. It cost them something. It will cost us something. God, give us an all-in abandonment to your cause. Give us a commitment level like we have never known. Give us success and favor in our efforts to make the name of Jesus famous in Buckeye. Amen. Amen.